so I think we'll get going here so we can learn about the fiction, fallacy, fact, fun, and future of Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, speak sure. to us, huh? Keep it short. <laughs> Google works all the time. All I've done is read the title. <laughs> and you wrote it that long. Uh, Bebo White is a graduate of the University of North Carolina, graduating in 1967. Uh, famous not exclusively, but largely for founding a jug band that led to be uh, the Red Clay Ramblers and a number of other bands. He drove from UNC at graduation to work at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and worked there for a long career. Still emeritus. Still emeritus. Uh, and it says so right there. Uh, along the line, Bebo was involved in setting up the first website in the U.S. He learned how to do uh, only a few seconds before me. <laughs> uh, and he's been involved in the World Wide Web Conference uh, from the beginning and from the ideas behind web development and web exchange. He's also a visiting professor or pardon me, a professor at the University in Hong Kong. <coughs> Bebo's taught numerous other places and is an experienced conference speaker. His research lately has dealt a lot with Bitcoin and blockchain. What he will talk to you about today as soon as I get out of the way and quit spacing. You're on. Okay, thanks Paul. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, let me say one little caveat at the beginning, and that is that, uh, as I told Paul, I have a lot of slides. And part of the reason for that is I wasn't really clear what the audience was going to be and what particular interest you might have. So I tried to be prepared for everything. Now that said, that means that I probably might skip some things unless they're questions. But <clears throat> the good news, maybe, for that is that you're welcome to all these slides. We'll talk to Paul about how they can become available and you can do whatever you want to with them. <clears throat> okay, um, so I thought this title was a little clever. I didn't realize that it would take up intro introduction time. Uh, so I might change it again. But anyway, the first thing I wanted to do at the beginning was make sort of a few observations. Paul mentioned the fact that <clears throat> Given my advanced age, I was involved with the web, I've been involved with the web for a long time. And uh, so I remember those times, you know, when the web was really exciting and we really thought about all the potential that the web had. And um, all the ways that it could benefit society and benefit mankind and those kinds of things. And some of those things have come true. Um, <clears throat> there's some bumps in the road still. But my caveat on this is that uh, this whole topic of Bitcoin and blockchain has gotten me just about as excited as I was about the web. Because I think that uh, the potential for it, the potential for this technology and the potential for this applications or these applications literally rivals in some ways you know, those grandiose potentials that we might have, uh, that we might have, expectations that we might have had for the web. Um, so you're going to hear me maybe show a little bit of that enthusiasm, but one thing I have to resist trying to do is being an evangelist, so I'm not going to tell you to go out and buy Bitcoin, <laughs> okay? I'm not going to do that, but just to try to look at things uh, observationally. Okay. Um, so in general, you know, what I have sort of on this slide is, you know, the whole subject about Bitcoin and cyber currency. So these are just a few little points that I thought of. And, and basically the summarization here is, you know, it's real. It's not some kind of fiction like I might have had in the title of the slide. And it's not, if you think about what kind of news coverage it's got, it's not strictly for things like Silk Road and things where people, crooks, can launder money or use for ransomware and those kinds of things. That's the kind of stuff that gets news. And that's also the kind of stuff that gives people sometimes a false 
concept of that when it's back. Um, but so I think these next two points is to say is that I believe in some ways that it is uh, a very powerful and empowering tool um, for all elements of society. But then, of course, there's the other attitude, which I have the quote here that Bitcoin and blockchain are a solution that has no problem. Okay. Um, and part of that, I think, comes from the fact is that clearly, I think we'll see in this talk, is that it scares a lot of people. It threatens a lot of people in terms of its concept or in terms of how it might change um, elements that you're involved in. If you're involved in banking, sure, your world's likely to change. Okay? And so that, in fact, I think shapes some people's attitude about what the whole technology might be about. Um, I put these up here. I've got, I tried to make things a little interesting with some of this. This thing on the right was basically a while back in San Francisco, there was an art show about Bitcoin. So when you see some of these things in my presentation, I've stolen them. Not stolen them, I had permission. But I use them in my presentation. <clears throat> but the idea here too, the time is now. The revolution has started. Alternative currency is it. The other one says, here's a picture of, a, of an ATM, Bitcoin ATM. And the key thing here is your future now. So clearly these is, this is the evangelistic part. Saying get on board or else get left behind. Okay, and Bitcoin is everywhere, I said. Um, this right here is a facility in New York City. This is in Paris. This is in Hong Kong. This is in San Francisco. Where you've really got this community that's being built around Bitcoin and trying to get people interested in Bitcoin and providing services via Bitcoin. Now I have to ask here, how many people in here own Bitcoin? Oh, okay. Three. That's good. Um, how many have really good reasons for not owning Bitcoin? You do. Can you? What? Oh, you have. <laughs> That's a pretty good reason. That's a pretty good reason. Um, what about quickly? Um, I think that many, many smart people are waiting for people who aren't as smart to get their money in wallets that aren't ready. Okay. Take it. That's perfectly, that's a perfectly reason. But that's the idea is you've, you've obviously given it some thought. Okay. Um, and good reasons for having it. You know, I, I first got Bitcoin because I taught a class in e-commerce, which clearly involved payment systems. And so I was, had to discuss it. And not only did I discuss it in that case, but I became enamored of it. So everybody has their own kinds of reasons. Um, this Paul might be familiar with. This was at the Internet Archive in San Francisco. This was the very first Bitcoin ATM that operated on the honor system. You took money out and you know, put cash in the cash box. And then you converted it to Bitcoin. A little bit not as sophisticated as those that you saw on that previous slide. The interesting thing about the Internet Archive, though, there's a lesson here, the reason I had that is because, as I'll mention, a number of employees at the Internet Archive get a portion of their salary in Bitcoin. Now you can ask why, maybe it's to avoid taxes, but one thing that has happened is the area in San Francisco where the Internet Archive is, a lot of the restaurants around there now accept Bitcoin because these people have Bitcoin. So they have, in their own way, become evangelists for the currency. Um, and organizations have found that by accepting the currency with basically no risk, they are providing a service to potential customers. Um, I, when I travel, I have this currency converter app on my phone. It has Bitcoin, okay, in case I go to some country that has no currency. <laughs> I can actually find out, hopefully find somebody who accepts Bitcoin. Now to me, this, since it's really here with all these other national currencies, 
you could ask yourself the question, does that give it some sort of legitimacy? Does that give it some sort of provenance that people that are involved in the currency conversion business recognize it as a viable mechanism for exchange? Okay, so quickly, very quickly, what is Bitcoin? One little quick thing to know is Bitcoin with a capital B is the protocol. Bitcoin with a little b is the currency. Um, it's designed for an internet society, whatever that means. Basically, it's saying, how can you actually do financial transactions online? Independent of state currencies. So it's decentralized. The idea, too, is it can be used like cash. So it can be anonymous. I can lose Bitcoin the same way I can lose, you know, money falling out of my wallet. Okay? So it's anonymous, not like credit cards. Um, I mentioned that I got involved in it because of e-commerce, but in addition to that, it satisfies one of the problems that have been discussed a long time, such things as microcurrencies, uh, micro or microtransactions. So, you know, suppose I want to charge somebody a tenth of a cent for something that they download. Effective, not free, but effectively free. I can't do that with state currencies. But I can easily do it with something like Bitcoin. And I can easily convert it to state currencies, as we saw in that previous slide. Okay, so overall, in general, that's what Bitcoin is. Okay, so here's part of the you know, whole discussion that you see about it. Bitcoin's futile quest to become a currency. I don't know that I believe that. Uh, the IRS says that Bitcoin is not currency, but is assets. Maybe that's why people at the Internet Archive get paid in it. Okay, it's more like a barter system. Um, except in some cases. Security regulations, and this, this one I like is that one of the ways in the current election that Rand Paul tried to appeal to people in, Sil in Silicon Valley was say, I will accept donations in Bitcoin. <laughs> cool. Well, we saw how far that got Rand Paul. hope that doesn't offend anybody. But a number of organizations, you know, have in fact tried to take advantage of the interest in Bitcoin. Now, it all started with a paper in 2008, you know, describing, as it were, the protocol, this is Bitcoin with B, of how to exchange value. And the whole system was open source, which meant then that people could take it and build upon it. Okay? And what we've seen as a result of that, I think, is that what it does, it is now is it's describing a platform. It's not an application. It's describing a platform that applications can be built on. Okay? One of which is the blockchain. Because whether or not, I will say, whether or not Bitcoin survives, <coughs> the blockchain is certainly probably going to be one of its lasting legacies. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, the whole thing about Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, has always, has that been part of the, the, the mythology surrounding Bitcoin? Um, you know, you've got people who claim they know who he is, or it might even be a group of people. And they have around, some guy with the last year or so ago, you know, happened to have that name, the press just followed him day and night. They denied it was him. You have other people that claim to be him but haven't offered any proof. And then you've got this one I thought was good. Is they nominated for a Nobel Prize. I don't know if the Nobel Committee can give a prize to somebody they can't prove exists. <laughs> that would be new. But it clearly sort of indicates part of the interest that the whole process has generated. Now, Paul can identify with this. I say that the whole Bitcoin and blockchain started with a paper. Well, look what else started with a paper. Everybody recognize what that is? He does. I do. yes. That's the web. The web started with a paper. And look what's happened. Simple little paper has caused 
the whole web revolution. And so having something start with a single paper that just came out of the blue is not unprecedented. And to some extent, I think we can see that that might be kind of the thing that happens you know, with Bitcoin. I say people are using it, um, not just for illegal activities, but I've even heard situations where, you know, you've got your financial advisor might say, hey, you know, why don't you diversify your portfolio and put some money in Bitcoin? I haven't gone that far. <laughs> okay? But it's not unheard of. Um, you can buy Dunkin' Donuts with Bitcoin. Or actually what you get is a Dunkin' Donuts gift card. Now, what I wanted to do, and uh, here's some of the other things that you can do. You know, buy pizza. Pizza for Bitcoin. And actually what they do is they operate as a clearinghouse, so this, will work, this should work anywhere in the world. Okay? And this, so that's pizza for coins. And so you've got this whole list. You can even buy a Tesla with Bitcoin. Um, so you've really got a lot of people that are taking it seriously. If for no reason, there's, that there's virtually no overhead in accepting Bitcoin. You don't have to get a machine like a, or process like you do with credit cards. You aren't paying transaction fees like you do with credit cards. <coughs> All you have to have are things on your phone. Bitcoin has taken over the food truck industry in San Francisco. Okay? Because you don't have to pay transaction fees. And you can do everything with your phone. So, organizations are using it. And I looked up, in this case too, several other examples. There's a thing called Curse.io. If you use fit Bitcoin, you get 15% off anything you buy from Amazon. That's, that's okay if you buy a lot of stuff from Amazon. So they really then are working out, in this case, working out partnerships that are encouraging people to use these currencies. Now, what's the business model behind that? So I had to look up and see who in the area took Bitcoin. Oh, right. Rise Biscuits Donuts. I gotta stop by there, I guess. There's one in Carver. There's one in Carver. They take Bitcoin. <laughs> okay? Put the Bitcoin numbers. I had to make sure that I identified at least one local merchant. And then I said in terms of innovation, I like this example. So if you're a DIY guy, you know, and you got a Raspberry Pi, here's a Raspberry Pi and Bitcoin powered pool table, right? So there's some interesting innovations that people are using and combining these technologies for. And that's an example of not only Bitcoin, but blockchain, ventures that are going on in the various whole aspects. So people are investing a lot of money. VCs are taking a lot of interest in applications of Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Okay, now bear with me here for a very short period of time. I'm going to talk about money, sort of a brief history of money. And this might help to put things in perspective if you're still not clear on what the idea behind <clears throat> a cyber currency might be. Well, first off, is token money. I don't need to explain that. This is money that's issued by like a bank or something like that. Um, if you lose it, it's lost. Uh, there's no intermediary required, but it requires faith in the issuer, like the mint or something of that nature. It has to have value. It has provenance simply because there's a centralized agency that tells you it is backed. So that's what you can think of as token money. There's this idea of notational money. And basically this is value that is stored in a ledger, like a checkbook. Um, you can't lose it as easily. 
but it still requires an intermediary in order to take advantage of it. It also requires some kind of faith in who maintains that ledger. Now, if that's just simply your personal checkbook ledger, that faith lies, you know, with you. Okay? So these are just basically the whole idea of entry and debit, credit and debit accounts um, that really does not directly translate into physical currency or token currency. I refer to hybrid money. And these are ones that have both some kind of token and some sort of ledger. And you can see some of the characteristics of those. You know, they can be lost. You still have to have an issue. It does an intermediary. So things like gift cards or something of that nature can be viewed as some sort of hybrid type of money. Or a check is hybrid money. It's simply a transition between either of those two, like the actual token money and the ledger-based money. So now, we raise this idea then of how can we go beyond that, and what does it mean if I were to use the term virtual money? Okay, so our definite, what I, our goals might be for virtual money, this is what Satoshi, is that we don't want a token, Tokens are no good because they suggest a centralized authority, um, no ledger, because once again, ledgers do involve some sort of intermediary, um, no issuer. So this sounds very good, but the question is, is it possible? Because, you know, with these criteria, the idea is, well, where does that value come from? Or how do you keep track of it? How do you keep the books? And how do you know it's a legitimate transaction? For example, you know, if I've got this, how, do, how, does somebody, how can somebody tell that I don't spend the same money twice? How can somebody prove that I actually paid them in virtual money if there's none of these elements? So that was the whole problem with trying to define how a virtual monetary system might work. <coughs> Digital money. So in this case, what we're saying, virtual money is just a string of bytes. And I say, another reason to back up your machines. Because if you lose, don't, if your machine crashes, your phone gets lost, your money's gone. Same way. If somebody can break into your system, since it's nothing but a digital file, you can lose that money. Remember, it's anonymous as well. So it's just like somebody picking your pocket. Okay? Here's another one of these art pieces, which I liked in this case. Somebody had a Monopoly game based on Bitcoin, you know, in terms of using how do you utilize these particular types of monetary systems. Okay, now I've got an analogy here that is often used for real estate. Um, when you deal with real estate systems, you can say that land or property ownership is defined by a chain of title, which basically then keeps track of who sells to whom, timestamp, right? This is real estate. This, this is not money in the sense that someone issues it, okay, in the sense of dollars. It has value. But the value is not reflected in this chain of ownership. You don't know how much these houses really sold for. So it's like a ledger in that sense. Okay, now in this particular case, we know that there's a government agency that keeps this registry and can search it. If the registry is altered, like if there's a change of government, or if the land, if the deeds agency burns to the ground, how can you prove that you own your house? 
something of that nature. Um, you can prevent double sowing because there's a time step, but not if the ledger's gone. Okay? So this is an idea about keeping track of transactions, transactions involving value, but aren't using any of those traditional types of money. Right? Because, in fact, you can do proof through this that you own the property, and you can prove that the property was transferred. You can prove that you didn't try to sell the property to two different people or something of that nature. Now, suppose we were to take this idea of a registry and we were to put it online. Instead of it residing in the deeds office, it's put online. And everybody can see it. You know, it didn't say how much the house cost, so you know there's no privacy involved here, maybe. But it does say for anybody to look and see who owns it, right? So suppose you take that and make it public. Now that means, as we said, that if those deeds are genuine and they're time stamped then people who get this, can see a copy of it, can easily agree on who owns that house, who has that value. Right? It's not under government control. Instead, what this is, if you distribute it on the network, it is under the control of a decentralized network. Right? It's owned by the members or verified by the members of the network, if you were able to take that. Now, when you think about deed registries, it happens that way simply because you didn't ever have the capacity to take this thing and broadcast it to the world. But clearly now technology has come along where we can do that. We can show this ledger to anybody, okay? And therefore get possibly their involvement in applications that involve that ledger. Remember this concept. Okay, now, I'm a little digression here. How many people in here are from CS? Okay. I'm going to go over this real quick. Um, first off is to say that one of the things that help systems such as this work is that security and privacy of these systems is ensured by cryptographic techniques. Trust is based on cryptographic techniques. And one of these techniques is the idea of a hash function. And the idea of a hash function is a one-way function, which is basically saying, I can take some information and I can condense it down to some fixed length string right, that's unintelligible, but is an immutable representation of that data. It's not encryption because I can't go the other way. I can't be given the results of this hash and figure out what the string is or what the file is that created that hash. In fact, that's the way you break a hash function is by coming up with the original data that can either replicate or has the same hash value as another set of data. Okay, so that's what hashes are. Okay, I mentioned in terms of one-way hash functions. First off is when you hash some data, it's easy to do, it's very fast. But if you try to go the opposite direction, it's very computationally intensive to try to figure out the data that resulted from that hash. This underlies a lot of the cryptography that you're going to see online. This underlies a lot of, you know, the whole idea of, of in, um, asymmetric encryption. So you're using this in digital envelopes, you know, when you use something like HTTPS. This is the, one of the ways that you ensure that no one has messed with the order that you sent to Amazon. Right? 
is because if they nest with it, it's going to create a different hash. Okay? The next thing I wanted to mention was this idea of asymmetric encryption, public-private key encryption. This is the idea where individuals have two keys. They've got a public key which they can distribute to the world, and they've got a private key that they themselves only know. And they're related to each other in a very computationally intensive way. Okay? So you can't have somebody easily find, have somebody's public key and figure out what their private key is. All right? This, once again, is very common, very established technology. You know, we use it all the time. All right? So remember this. We're going to talk about the role that it's going to be playing in Bitcoin. So, when I say that what is Bitcoin really, we would say that there is no physical object where that represents value. But instead what you have is a chain of digitally signed, and that's where we bring in hash and things like that, transactions leading from one owner to the current owner. So in that way it's similar to this idea that we had about deeds. If somebody attempts to change one of the elements in those records, they're going to have to create or recreate the entire chain, which is virtually computationally impossible. Certainly computationally impossible within the period of time that they would have to do it and it be broadcast to the network. Okay? And these transaction records contain hashes and they contain anonymous IDs. This is where the anonymity comes in. They don't have your name on Okay? There's no traditional registry and there's no centralization. So basically, given the idea that we had about a distributed registry and that the way that registry is managed, <coughs> That's how you are identifying value in Bitcoin. Okay, so everybody has an address. This address, you know, is comparable basically to your, like, your public key. That you know you can give to everybody. So here's a sample. As we said, it's the same way with asymmetric, so it's very computationally derived. Um, to send Bitcoin, I simply only need your address. And by seeing that address, I don't know who you are, but I can send you Bitcoin. I can send you and then specify, and if I want to receive Bitcoin, I just give you my public address. And you can send me Bitcoin. And people cannot see these addresses and know who that user is. In fact, if you use Bitcoin a lot, you can change the address every time. Okay, you don't have to keep the same address. Okay? So that's what Bitcoin addresses do in that case. Well, most people aren't going to be able to necessarily remember the way that works, so we're going to show how that does. Now, what happens in terms of transaction, this is really this distributed ledger concept. So, somebody wants to give money to somebody else. I get their address. I use tools to basically send them some number of Bitcoin. <coughs> okay? This transaction becomes a part of what is referred to as a block. And a block is simply a collection of transactions. In the case of the Bitcoin specifications, it's approximately 10 minutes worth of transactions. Okay? And that block is broadcast to anyone who's interested in the network. So they get this block that's being created by all these transactions. And it is their problem to take this block and to verify 
its validity. To say, all this is okay. This, I paid you some Bitcoin, and I have enough Bitcoin to give you that. Or I have not spent this Bitcoin before, so I'm not trying to spend money that I've already spent. Okay? So it is up to basically the people in the network to prove that's valid. Okay, now how do they do that? Because that information is going to be hashed. Well, basically, the idea in Bitcoin alone is to say, well, give these people, you know, who are in this network, a very hard problem to do, a very hard problem to solve. And the first one who solves that problem gets paid a reward. And they get paid this reward, and they can add that reward to that block. And if everybody else on the network agrees that they solved that problem, then that block can be added to the list of transactions and the recipient gets his money. Okay? It sounds like some, bit, some new Bitcoin is being created. You're exactly Bitcoin. right. It's inflation. You, no, it's not. <laughs> But it actually, it sounds like inflation, because we'll get to that. But you're exactly right. So, what is happening here is when this person who verifies it, and they're called Bitcoin miners, when they solve this problem and they get paid in Bitcoin, they get paid in new Bitcoin. Okay? So this is the way Bitcoin gets added to the overall pool of Bitcoin. The analogy, certainly by choice of name, says the same thing. If you've got someone mining for gold, they've got to put a lot of effort in it. They find some gold. They find some gold that has never been as a part of the monetary pool before. They bring it out of the ground, and it gets introduced into the financial system until all the gold's gone. So, this is suggesting, once again, that while they get paid in Bitcoin and you're introducing new Bitcoin into the system, there has to be some way of controlling the amount of Bitcoin, new Bitcoin, that's getting introduced into the system. And All right. So, I say what's happening here? All of the issues that we listed in terms of virtual currency that might have been required by having a centralized authority or third party system, like some sort of intermediary, like a clearinghouse for credit cards or something like that, all that is being handled by two things. First, strong encryption like hashes and asymmetric encryption. And since we want it to be decentralized, it's handled by peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So miners are doing this. They have the community. They broadcast their solutions to their other people in the community and get verification of the fact that their particular block is valid to be added to the chain. Yeah? So does the, does the miner's um, identity um, become part of the block? Mm -mm. Oh, their ID does. Yeah. Their, their ID, right. certainly. But, their ID but that's anonymous. anonymous. It is anonymous. That's anonymous, they, because they're getting paid Bitcoin once again through their, their ID. So you don't know that it's a particular person or something of that nature. And that ID can change. And that identity can change, yes. yes. It could change with every transaction. Well, no, that's up to, you know, that's up to both the payers and the receivers. You know, I'm, if, I, if I start using, I want to use a different ID for every transaction, it's up to me to keep track of it. If I've got people paying me under a lot of different IDs, 
It's up to me to try and to keep track of that. Um, that's not a fault of the system. Okay, in fact, what you see here is basically, you know, your wallet. This is who keeps track of basically what it does. So here's my public Bitcoin address. Okay. And since I don't want to remember it, usually that's represented, especially if I like, go to an ATM, Bitcoin ATM. I represent this with my with a QR code. Right? And this is basically what one of the wallets, I'm not recommending a particular wallet might look like, you know. So I can pay to somebody, you know, I can label it, I can specify an amount, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's nothing in there that necessarily has any identity associated with it. As I say, this is just an example of a wallet. And here, as I mentioned before, in this particular example, you said you can see where you know, I can specify a new address. And presumably then that wallet would take on the role of helping me to manage what addresses I have active. What identities I have active. So, if I can't remember my public key, or if anybody in here, you guys who have Bitcoin, you want to tip me for this talk? <laughs> You're going to pay me for this time? I don't really mean that, Paul. I'm um, trying to figure out how. Here's my public key. So this is all you need to know to give me Bitcoin. And even if you could interpret that, you would not find that it has any sort of identity that you would be able to trace back to me. Okay, so... How do you get Bitcoin? Well, one way we talk about is a miner. Well, most people don't have the facilities for doing that. It's not worth the return on investment. So I say that's not likely. But you could sell something for Bitcoin. You could take a salary, like I mentioned the Internet Archives. But that's between you and the IRS when tax time comes. I don't think the Internet Archives puts it on your W-2. Um, you could get a donation of Bitcoin. You could use a Bitcoin exchange or an ATM. Games, gambling, etc. rewards. But there's a lot of different ways that you can actually add to your Bitcoin wallet. Steal it. Well, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> you could steal it. That's certainly... I should probably add, realistic, in, in good faith, I should add that to that list. Because certainly that has happened. Um, but bear in mind, that's not a fault of Bitcoin. The example that I like to use here, and if you look at some of the most notorious cases, like Mt. Gox, this is just traditional embezzlement. It is not a flaw in the protocol that led to that. Okay, now Bitcoin mining. I'm not going to go into this in detail because basically what I have here, in the interest of time, basically what I have here is that problem solving. Now the interesting thing about this is the fact that this is a solution for Bitcoin, right? In the sense that since Bitcoin represents money, you would suspect that people will try to hack it because it has value. It's the whole Willie Sutton thing. Why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Okay, if you were to use the same idea, this, chain, this distributed ledger idea, you wouldn't have to have something as computationally intensive as Bitcoin was. Because all you really need to have in this is some sort of proof of work or proof of existence or something of that nature. Something that a miner has to do and then that the group can agree upon. So it does not have to be something as complex as what happens with Bitcoin. So if you're interested in the details 
for Bitcoin mining, that's what these slides do. Now, there was the question about Bitcoin inflation. Now, the whole protocol in Satoshi's paper basically says there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin in existence. Never. Okay, and the expected time to hit that is around 2033. So what happens after 2033? All the Bitcoin that's ever been mined is going to be in the system. So, but instead of inflation, what it likely might mean is that you will see perhaps less transactions happening in integrals of Bitcoin. You will see more in fractions of Bitcoin. But what you're not doing is you're not printing any new money. Now that's going to have a greater transaction. How do you get the motivation for people to do mining if they're not getting paid? Okay? That's also been addressed too. But there is this controlled inflation. Okay, this one is important. So what happens is that now after every 210,000 blocks, the miner gets, start off at 25 Bitcoin, which is, that's a pretty good deal if I'm giving you two Bitcoin, paying you two Bitcoin and the miner gets paid 25, that's a pretty good return. Okay, but there's a graduated scheme in terms of every four years, all right, that number of transactions is when that payment gets cut in half. <clears throat> This is about where we are right now. So now miners get about 12 and a half Bitcoin. That's still not bad. If you think now that Bitcoin's around 600 bucks, that's not bad. At the end of this, what the miner reward is one Satoshi. You know what a Satoshi is? First name of the founder. 10 to the minus eight Bitcoin. Right? One one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. When we talk about micropayments, there you go. That's a small amount. Um, okay, so that's once again where we say we get to the point where I'm going to motivate, motivate miners. Well, there's something else to be said about mining. And these are a couple of stories. You know, there's, now there's a lot of mining that's going on in, in China. And there's this projection... Look at the impact, and we, remember this is very computationally intensive. This requires a lot of power, and if you look at this particular story, you know, these guys are sitting right next to a hydroelectric plant. And if you believe this story, you know, by 2020, the power consumption is going to be ridiculous. So is Bitcoin environmentally sensitive? Well, maybe not. Okay, this is one of these Chinese networks. <coughs> they generate 4,000 Bitcoins a month, about one and a half million dollars a month with these huge compute farms. Okay, and I already said this, why is mining so difficult? You know, primarily because once again, it involves money. And you have to make it secure. You have to make it hard. Okay? Now, what happens when the mining fee gets to one Satoshi? Here's that hashing process that you see here. It basically says, okay, there's got to be transaction fees. There's got to be things by which you reward the peer-to-peer -peer process, people that are adding things to the blockchain. Because they are probably not going to get their return on investment if they're only getting one Satoshi per block. So they can collect transaction fees. Or they can do things like expedited blocks. People pay them to get blocks to go through quicker. That's one issue with respect to this. So if we talk about 10 blocks, I mean, blocks every 10 minutes getting transacted, that is a century compared to how quickly Visa processes transactions. Right? We're talking millions and probably millions in a 10-minute period. 
Okay? So maybe what can happen in terms of this is if you want this increased throughput, that's going to be something that is going to give you the incentive to, to provide that for mine. Is, is that intersection point, uh, uh, the, is the vertical axis errors and what error would... Um, that's basically saying, you know, when does it become financially feasible? Right. You know, as a guess, when does it become... When you consider the reward versus, as you saw in the other ones, about what power costs and things like that, that's a projection about when you may be spending more on power and computation than you're getting the reward back in Bitcoin. So it's saying the importance then of transaction fees. So I have here 21 million Bitcoin, 2.1 <clears throat> times 10 to the 15th Satoshis. Okay, that's more than there's US dollars in the world. So it's very likely that when you go buy your Tesla in a couple of years, you might be paying for it in Satoshis rather than Bitcoin. Well, that's okay. And this is from Bitcoin Info. This is basically saying the number of Bitcoins in circulation. So that's sort of an interesting thing right now. And the way that the prices has fluctuated. And so when you look at this fluctuation in price, which is what a lot of people then identify when you talk about Bitcoin, and sure it fluctuates a lot, but there's two things I have to say about that. First off, is that how many of us have been around when a new currency was invented? And I don't mean switching over to euros or something. So you would expect there to be a lot of fluctuation. Um, the second thing, if you look at this, is that a lot different than the stock market or the currency market? I like this cartoon. I want to diversify with Bitcoin. And says, how is that different from the stock market? And the guy says, well, I can't charge you any fees. <laughs> OK? You can't read that. So how is that different? I would somehow contend that it's not, if you thought there was any stability to Bitcoin. I couldn't resist throwing this in. <laughs> you know, if you have. You know, once again, the way that, in, that uh, financial markets are influenced, some people certainly believe that if you really believe that Trump can win, go buy yourself some, go speculate on some Bitcoin. <clears throat> Bad things do happen. Here's a list history of some of them. I won't go into those in detail. Um, there is a list of vulnerabilities. <coughs> These are well documented in terms of things that can go wrong, because it is software. Um, and bank robbery by hackers, malware attacks, those things are certainly things that some can be controlled and some can't. Um, now, talking about cyber currencies in general, there's right now over 700 different ones. These are all represent forks of Satoshi's protocol. So anybody can create their own cyber currency. So, so very quickly, the five elements of cyber currency, currency, being able to send value. Commodity, I say scarcity stores wealth. You've got a limited number of things, they're hard to get to, so just like gold and diamonds, Bitcoin is valuable because it's scarce. Brand protocol, and technology. Technology, if you believe in cryptographic techniques and the robustness of those, there's no reason for you not to think that they're equally robust in something like Bitcoin. Okay, so quickly, you know, what are some of the possible futures that I see for something like cyber currency? This number one is my favorite. A lot of people in the world do not qualify for bank accounts. They can't get a bank account. What is a way that they can control their money or their value? Uh, Paul mentioned I work in Hong Kong. 
There's a lot of Filipinos, nannies that work in Hong Kong, and every weekend you see them lined up sending money by Western Union back to the Philippines and paying up to 15% transaction fees. That's criminal. Because they can't, they don't qualify for bank accounts. So I think it's empowering. Small businesses, etc. Okay? So I think there's a lot of good ways that, that Bitcoin and cyber currencies can have impact on social structure. This was the potential I talked about before. There's the economic and political issues that are associated with them. Transparency, for example, you know, in terms of what you see in banking, what happened in Wells Fargo, those kinds of things. Developing nations, you can see that cyber currencies can have a potential impact in those particular areas. If Scotland had left the UC, they would we can. The UK was not going to allow them to keep using the pound. Possibly could cyber currency have been an option for them, or still might be. Okay? As a way then of reacting to some of these possible social or political forces. Okay, now quickly I was going to say in terms of its impact. Um, you know, who, who's the guarantee that Bitcoin's going to be around? If you've got Bitcoin, you hope it's going to be around. But it's never really going to disappear. Why? Because the blockchain can't disappear. The blockchain's everywhere. The blockchain's in the ether. It's never going to disappear. Okay? So Bitcoin can't disappear. People may stop using it. So what we've seen, though, is started a discussion. And so we're going to see in some of these other technologies, some of these other forks of cyber currencies, are things that have different schemes based on, it, on that. And I believe that the current biggest legacy of Bitcoin is going to be the blockchain or distributed ledger technology. Okay? And we basically went through some of this. We talked about the distribution. We talked about the peer-to-peer -peer elements, elements, we talked about cryptography, et cetera, et cetera. Bear in mind that this whole idea of distributed ledgers is independent of Bitcoin. It was in the same paper, okay? But you do not have to have Bitcoin to utilize the ideas behind the blockchain. So I would say, too, once again, that the blockchain is a platform where you get applications for. <clears throat> this slide simply represents the current size of the blockchain. So it's about 87 gigs, which sounds large, but you're going to have that on your phone. Yeah, that's not. So it's not that big when you all things considered. So, can blockchain just, in some ways, are we coming up, I would say, in the age of blockchain? So it might actually be one of the next significant technological errors. Where instead of transferring information, what you have with blockchain is the provenance or ownership, plus all the other. So you can see, in some ways, some of the potential roles that it might play and what we would consider to be some of the currently for or uh, predicted future technologies. Okay, and in fact, if you see, this is from Google Trends. You know, there's increased interest. This would be the current, this was last week. You know, in interest about blockchain. Not so much interest in Bitcoin, but the idea of a distributed ledger and maintaining a distributed ledger. <clears throat> and so here's a couple of quotes in terms of it. Basically saying, you know, it is a way, as it were, of proving the existence, just like our deeds. 
But in other words, take this ledger that had deeds on it and put everything from votes to copyrights to patents to everything like that and using it as a mechanism for proving the existence of that entity and the ownership of that entity at a time and the world being the judge in terms of the validity of that interest. The second one really is where I talked about it in terms of being a platform. So what can characteristics can you take of it to build these new types of applications? This is from the WEF, World Economic Forum, in their current report, in their current report. Blockchain will become the beating heart of financial systems. They're not, bear in mind that says blockchain, that does not say Bitcoin. But as a way of keeping track of financial transactions. I like this quote a lot. I hope that no one is offended by the Deepak Chopra insinuation. I couldn't resist it since I'm a physicist. It's one of these people who say, you know, this is just, this is people gone nuts. You know, these are people who, a solution in search of a problem. And here's another one. Blockchain says, does nothing but circumvent the rules we have imposed on banks to keep them honest. Well, really? Has it really? <laughs> Has it really? Um, SEC approves plan to issue stock via Bitcoin. <clears throat> by blockchain, I'm sorry. Once again saying, okay, what do you do when you transfer stock? It's like our assets ledger. You prove the ownership, the path of ownership. So why wouldn't that work very well in, in stock exchanges? Here's a report from the inspected US Postal Service. They're even thinking of introducing something called postcoin so that you get away from the financial aspects if you want to send a, send a package to another country. You use a cyber currency. This is the U.S. Post Office. It's not talking about Bitcoin, but it is talking about blockchain. Um, there's this whole idea of block com. This is probably the new version of dot-com. You know, basically looking at companies that are being funded based on blockchain technology. Everything from crowdfunding to decentralized messaging and applications to distributed cloud systems. Distributed cloud systems basically says, look, why should Amazon and Azure and all Dropbox, why do all these guys have a monopoly on storage sharing? Why can't I give some of my, why can't I sell some of my disk space to somebody? Um, and even decentralized voting. Um, this is not the Bitcoin blockchain. So you've got companies that are basically now talking about enterprise level blockchains, private blockchains. They work pretty much the same way, but don't have necessarily the same idea of proof of work that you saw in something like the Bitcoin blockchain. And of course they're banking on the idea too that we are in fact entering now into the blockchain era. That that is going to be one of the relevant driving technologies. There's a project called Hyperledger, which is basically this idea about advancing block, but making it all open source. So once again, building open source platforms, this is driven by Mark Baron Bellendorf, you know, basically who started the Apache project. So it's going to be based on something in the same way that you have an open source project like you have on the other ones. But you're, what you're doing is designing um, blockchains. 
inner ledger is something that the web community is working on. So in other words, coming up, as it will, from mechanisms for connecting blockchains. So, you know, how, in fact, can you combine all these technologies with existing technologies and have intersections between them? Not force everybody to move over to blockchain, say, for financial transactions, perhaps, but have them collaborate with one another in some of the existing types of financial systems. And in fact, Blockstack, we go back to the web, Tim Berners-Lee, he has a blockchain ID based on Blockstack. And if you look at this architecture, he's referring to it as the new decentralized internet, this part of this is a very traditional type of web architecture, except for one major thing. It is no longer this client-server architecture which is centralized, but it's decentralized using blockchain technology. So it becomes stateful. So it becomes stateful. Yeah, exactly. So basically then a lot of the transactions that we typically might think of as happening, we saw in the web, are actually being managed by the blockchain. So you can't attack websites because for the same reasons that you have associated with security. One idea behind part of this too is that <clears throat> blockchain will replace things like HTTPS. You won't need them because that won't be the same security concerns that you had with a client server architecture. Okay. Summary. Now, as far as Bitcoin and blockchain, I think, it's my opinion here, I think that both of them are very disruptive. And can, once again, I said I have the enthusiasm of the impact that they might have on a wide variety of different fields. They both are going to invoke new variations. As I said, Bitcoin might not survive, but you started the discussion. Okay? Um, there's a lot of social issues, business issues associated with it. So as a result, like we've already seen, it's really going to provide a very rich area for research, for innovation. I predict a lot of people are going to make money on blockchain. And it's going to require people. Hyperledger says that one of the things that's holding them back is finding employees to work on. They need people. This is someone that over that art. So I encourage you, once again, I'm not going to evangelize on it. But I encourage you to at least investigate. Make up your own minds. Okay? Get on board. You know, make a contribution. I don't mean monetary contribution. But what this needs is insight and ideas. Okay. Never underestimate an old man who graduated from North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. I know I ran over. I don't know how much time we have. We can take a few minutes for questions. And Any in fact, comments? I have, I have one from Twitter, just sort of a comment. We have people We're that are over. watching from uh, MetLife. Yeah. And one of the things they asked to point out is that MetLife has joined the banking consortium for uh, blockchain, uh, which is R3CVE. Yes. And yes. Uh, so the people in MetLife here in the triangle are watching and uh, they're interested in what this means to their company, so this has uh, been very useful. They disagree with anything I've said? So far, not. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if uh, I can ask more, but just to put that on the table, okay, kind thanks. of underline what you've done, that people, you're looking for a company in this area that's using a blockchain, it's MetLife. 
Well, the R3C, I didn't mention that. The consortium is very active. They have a number of very, very substantial, a number of very substantial members. That's not to denigrate MetLife. No, no. But certainly that's one of them. So, any, you have a comment? Well, again, I'm, I'm trying to sort of wrap my head around um, uh, how we get beyond ownership to, say, something like reputation for a blockchain sort of assessment of reputation. Or I mean, we mentioned citations, and so you know, we in, in the act in the academy, we use citations as sort of a a a kind of a currency for impact, sure. uh, a surrogate for that, and. Um, because the, the, the way that the, the computations take place, it's pretty much exact. I mean, because I mean, you, you, you want it to know, yes, this belongs to me or not. But in, in, in the voting that, has, that takes place, so the, the miners, uh, the first miner to sort of demonstrate that they've computed Solve the, the right problem. answer, some other people have to verify that yeah. and then it's okay. And I'm thinking about you know, just something as simple as like ResearchGate or the, the, the reputation sort of uh, <coughs> systems that are emerging in, in, in sort of the web now. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to think about this so that it's not such an exact thing, but you have some sort of voting to say, yeah, this person is really the, uh, the, the person who was the first person who put up a web page as opposed to the one who did it three seconds later. And you know how do people argue about that? And they might write books about it. And 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 somehow it would be really nice if we could say, yeah, it was really Bebo. Paul was second I'm or third, that, or at least third, I think. No, you know what? Those talking. kinds of applications, I think, are appearing. One thing that I didn't mention is, you know, looking at we had that long list of these other currencies. Someone, uh, some of you might have heard of Ethereum, which is a which is a fork. They had their own currency called Ether. But um, they have tried to add, you know, some of these, exactly these kinds of capabilities to applications of the blockchain that were not in Bitcoin. For example, one of the major things in Ethereum has to do with what they refer to as smart contracts. So monitoring contracts, okay, which basically then you have in the blockchain literally logic that says, okay, at this date, do this, uh, pay somebody this money. Or, as you might suggest in this case, there's also this idea of color coins where you actually can attribute a physical asset like a research paper to the blockchain. The blockchain doesn't contain the paper. But what if the blockchain is able to reference, let's say, a physical asset, or not physical necessarily in that sense, but an asset that can be traced. Yeah. So you would be able to see that and once again prove its provenance. So I think those two things, like contracts and what are called color coins, which is that second one, you know, would allow you some sort of flexibility with doing things as, as you discuss. You know, you're not, you certainly in some cases are not gonna leave those kinds of decisions up to the miners because they're not gonna be qualified to do it, right? But what you are gonna have to provide is some kind of mechanisms for users of the blockchain to use it as a tool to resolve questions like you asked. Why? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't see how it would work, but I, I mean, I think we, we need that. We, yeah. we need that for research data and, and, and sort of, um, you know, in, in all sorts of domains. I agree. Yeah. There's, I agree a, there's an attempt to do that with music tagging yeah. right now, and that's almost, that's pretty orthogonal to the same problem. You know, some creative object needs to be tagged as belonging to somebody so that when somebody else has it, because watermarking and those kind of things don't work or they interfere. So uh, people in intellectual property area, there are three or four projects like that. Patents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Anything and things that can move transnationally too. Sure. So again, it's, look, go ahead. Pardon me. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry, so uh, I guess this fits into a broader category. There's been discussion among the sort of digital preservation community about how blockchain can be used for authentication and have this kind of distributed environment. And the thing that I constantly butt my head up against and just can't seem to understand is what's the financial model there? Because, I mean, everything in Bitcoin is based on these miners using massive computational resources to mine these... You know, right. That's that, ...that they're going to get financially <clears throat> compensated for. So it seems like I've seen a lot of these thought experiments of people saying, 
wouldn't this be a terrific architecture for X? And it's something where we'd love to have a distributed ledger, and I don't understand who's going to pay for that. Well, right? no, the, the, the question, I think, once again, it's back on that other, when it comes to the issue of incentivization. Okay? Um, when you talk about public, uh, private blockchains, you know, you, you know, literally could have what is count, you know, sort of associated with mining being done by subject matter experts. Okay? They're incentivized for one reason or another, just like you talked about in terms of research papers. Um, none of those are going to be necessarily, you know, they're going to have to basically be invented to work with the blockchain. The blockchain does assume some sort of idea of proof of work or proof of existence, but does not attempt to specify all the ways in which that kind of work, you know, has to be done or could be done. So <clears throat> it's all we're only talking about the fact of the advantages that a distributed ledger could provide. So the issue could be, you know, whoever are comparable to miners in you know, we talked about in that particular case, mm -hmm. this was broke. Then, um, what kind of incentive can you have for people for the effort that's required? And it doesn't necessarily have to be as computationally intensive as you've seen for Bitcoin miners. But what kind of incentivization do they have for validating entries that are placed on the blockchain? So, well, one of the other assumptions is that with blockchain, you're dealing with untrusted parties. Right. right. If that's not your assumption, you don't even need something like this. Yeah. Now you just need copies of your data somewhere. Right, but if you fully trust everyone, there's no reason to have this massively distributed ledger. Yeah, oh, exactly. exactly. It's, about things, it's about things It's about things that will be challenged. Exactly. So, so yeah, uh, you've got what? a smaller community of trustedness yeah. defined some other way, then you don't need something like this necessarily. Yeah. So, um, just to... Uh, We'd like to continue this conversation, but we also have food and drink right out here, which Susan Sylvester was pointing to and opened the door to. And we hope you'll continue this conversation with Bebo and with each other as we go there and within the uh, within Manning Hall and beyond, where the information science lives. Because these are, are, are good questions that have to do with information management, authority, and uh, decentralization. It's not just about money, but money is a pretty good place to start. Anyway, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, it was, you know, I, I, as I said, I will give Paul basically, you know, please take a look if you want or interested want the at the that doesn't yeah at the uh, at the slides, comments, questions, pot shots, everything is welcome. Okay. Um, and even if you, once again, even if you disagree, if you agree with one of those things that says it's a solution looking for a problem, that it's technology gone wild, that you really don't think there's a future in it, fine. I'm perfectly willing to accept that. I own Bitcoin, but not that much. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, guys.